Good morning, everyone, and happy New Year's Eve. As we look ahead to next week with kids returning to school, we have Secretary French here with us remotely to give our education update. We know teachers, administrators, parents, and kids are probably feeling some mixed emotions right now looking at next week's return. So we wanted to remind folks of the protocols of our guidance this morning because they did change just a bit from Thanksgiving. As well, we wanted to look ahead a few months at our longer term recovery. Most schools had already closed for the holidays uh, last week when we announced the update to youth sports and social gathering guidance. These changes will have a few impacts on our schools. First, winter sports, uh, winter sports teams may begin practicing as long as they follow the guidance. And as I've said, we'll continue to watch the data with hopes of getting games restarted just as soon as possible. Next, as we discussed last week, schools do not have to include a, a question on their daily health checker about multi-household gatherings. These, uh, these changes were supported by what we've seen in our school surveillance testing and what we've heard from schools uh, after Thanksgiving. I would, however, remind everyone that we all have a responsibility to keep our schools safe, which means following quarantine guidance for travel and staying home when you're not feeling well or have been in contact with someone who has COVID. Our proven health and safety measures remain in place at our schools. And as we announced before Thanksgiving, our regular testing of school employees continues. Every week, staff at about a quarter of our schools have their opportunity to get tested for the coronavirus, which means almost every staff member can get tested each month. And we've been doing this since mid-November. Since this testing program launched, we found a positivity rate of under 0.26%. Let me say that again, 0.26%. For comparison, the general population is about 10 times that rate, 2, two to 2.5% two in the same time period. This tells us a few things. First, the risk of transmission is lower in our schools than in the general community, and that's a good thing. It also shows dedication from school employees to follow the guidance in order to keep each other safe and their students learning in school which I really appreciate. And it indicates that while we've seen some cases associated with schools, there has been very little transmission within the buildings. While there are school-based cases and situations, they are the exception and not the rule, and they're not driving our outbreaks. Again, I believe this is because teachers, administrators, parents, and kids have all done a great job following the rules and creating a safe school environment. I wanna thank you for your efforts. It's made a huge impact for our kids and we're so very grateful. Looking ahead, we know we need to have a plan in place to address other needs kids might have as a result uh, of this pandemic and the disruption it may have had on their learning and development over the past 10 months. Secretary French will go into more detail shortly but we're working on how we can best measure the impacts once students are back in person full time. While we don't have a specific date for when that will be, we hope it will be very soon. So we're preparing now. The Agency of Education will be working with districts and local leaders in the coming weeks, making sure they have the resources and plans in place so we can hit the ground running. Finally, I thought I should note that this is our 100th media briefing since I declared the state of emergency. I want to first thank all the members of the media who have been covering them, asking critical questions, and helping to inform Vermonters. And I want to thank all those who tune in to help understand what you can do to keep yourselves safe as well as your neighbors. It's your efforts that got us to where we are today still the lowest in the nation in many categories. As well, with the upcoming holiday, I hope you celebrate the end of 2020 safely and responsibly, 
and adhere to our health guidance. I know this has been an incredibly difficult year, full of so many challenges, and many are looking forward to putting all of that behind us. As we move forward into the new year, let's remember the 136 Vermonters who lost uh, their lives to this pandemic. And keep in mind that uh, that number likely would have been much higher if not for our collective action to step up. But let's also understand the risks that remain. And as this uh, continues to attack our long-term care facilities, uh, it's important that we stay vigilant. So as you celebrate, please remember to make the right choices to protect your families, loved ones, and neighbors. I'm so grateful uh, to all Vermonters for all you've done as, we, uh, as we've moved through this pandemic. And we'll get through this uh, in, in the new year uh, together. So with that, I'll now turn it over to Secretary French. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, good morning. Uh, certainly good news uh, that our case counts for the virus have leveled off a bit. Uh, we're hopeful this trend will continue in the coming weeks and through mid-January uh, when we'll have a full understanding or more full understanding of the patterns and the data as a result of the December holiday period. We've consistently heard from our medical experts, including Vermont's pediatrician community, that the conditions in Vermont have been very conducive for in-person instruction. Uh, in addition to the educational reasons for making in-person instruction a priority, we have heard from our medical experts that in-person instruction is essential for the overall well-being of our children. Our goal, uh, therefore, remains uh, to provide as much in-person as possible as the conditions allow. Uh, the qualifier being as the conditions will allow. This means uh, we need to have an accurate understanding of our current conditions so we can project how those conditions might change in the coming weeks and months. In terms of our current conditions, uh, Vermont's conditions for in-person uh, were positive before the holiday period, and it appears that they will remain so afterwards. Uh, this becomes apparent when comparing Vermont to other states in the region. I was struck uh, by Commissioner Pichek's data on Tuesday <clears throat> that compared the COVID-19 cases among the northern New England states. Uh, Vermont, uh, for example, has had 7,000 cases since March. Uh, New Hampshire has had the same number of cases in just the last two weeks. And Maine, unfortunately, has had about 8,000 cases in the last three weeks. We're also seeing confirmation of our conditions and the surveillance testing data from the schools, uh, which to the best of my knowledge is the only statewide surveillance testing program in the country focused on school staff. We've been testing 25% of our schools each week during the month of December. Uh, we're still seeing about a 40% participation rate in school staff, which means about 6,000 staff are being tested each week. Uh, but the data do provide a sense of the statewide conditions since we include schools from all parts of the state in each week's testing cohort. It is interesting uh, to note that through the month of December, the state level testing positivity rate for Vermont has hovered around 2%. And again, here too, we compare very favorably to our neighboring states where New Hampshire has a positivity rate about 10% and Maine about 7%. Our surveillance testing positivity rate for school staff is not only lower than our overall state positivity rate, but it also has been declining during December. When we tested all schools in mid-December, or excuse me, mid-November, the positivity rate was 0.26%. Uh, since then, each week of our testing, the positivity rate has dropped, and most recently was 0.04%, uh, the week of the 13th of December, which is the last week uh, we have data from the surveillance testing. So, as we are contemplating our next steps in education, uh, it's important to acknowledge that Vermont's conditions uh, for the virus are substantially better than our neighboring states and are some of the best in the country. This can certainly change if we're not vigilant, uh, but this conclusion is the starting point as we contemplate our next steps. This reminds me of where we were in the summer uh, when we were starting the planning process for reopening our schools. As we heard from Dr. Fauci and others, uh, where you start on the curve is an important consideration in your decision making. Many states this summer were not necessarily in the best position to reopen their schools, but Vermont was. And our school staff worked incredibly hard to implement the necessary mitigation strategies to ensure the safety of our schools. 
The success of their efforts has been apparent in the epidemiological data, which shows very limited transmission of the virus in our schools. Now that we are contemplating shifting into the recovery phase of our work in education, it's important to acknowledge that Vermont is again starting from a position of advantage. It is important, of course, that we remain vigilant, so we will continue the surveillance testing in January uh, because it's an important tool for us to monitor the conditions. But with the major holidays behind us and the advent of vaccines, we can look forward to conditions improving in the coming months. When students return from the holiday vacations, many schools will be returning to some form of hybrid learning. Uh, some schools, in anticipation of worsening health conditions from the holidays and the related impact on staff availability, decided to implement remote learning. Other schools have planned to implement more in person if the conditions permitted. As we shift into what will be the recovery phase, it will be important that all schools prioritize increasing the amount of in-person instruction. Our recovery work in education will be predicated on the restoration of in-person instruction, in-person routines, and in-person relationships. At the state level, we will continue to provide an assessment of the health conditions through an analysis of our surveillance te testing information and other data. And we will make adjustments to our guidance in response to changing conditions as necessary. At the local level, school leaders and school boards should focus their decision-making on managing the complex logistics of their operations. Staff availability, for example, will remain a concern in the coming months, but the assessment of local and regional health conditions will remain a state responsibility. To date, we've used the term mitigation to describe the steps we have taken to prevent the virus from entering our schools and stopping its spread when it does. We will need to continue to focus on safe operations, but as we enter the recovery phase, mitigation will take on new meaning. From a public health perspective, successful mitigation is defined by to what extent we're able to limit the spread of the virus in our schools. From an educational perspective, however, successful mitigation will be determined by to what extent we limit the impact of the pandemic on the healthy development and educational progress of each of our students. Vermont must be as successful in our educational mitigation as we have been in our health mitigation. The good news is Vermont's in a great position to start this work now. Our conditions are arguably the best to do so, and we cannot afford to wait until the emergency is over to begin. That concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, Secretary French. Just wanted to give you uh, some update of uh, the vaccination program and some updates on some other things as well. Nearly 14,000 Vermonters have been vaccinated as of last night. 21% of phase 1A has been vaccinated and 2% of the overall eligible population here in Vermont has been vaccinated. Starting next week, we'll begin updating our external vaccination da dashboards on Tuesdays and Fridays. And then the following week, Monday through Friday, daily, Monday through Friday. I want to turn to the amount of vaccines coming in to the state from the federal government. It is hoped that vaccine vaccination pace will accelerate over the next few weeks. However, I am concerned because our federal vaccine allotments have been cut from what we are expecting to what we are receiving next week. Next week, we will receive 3,900 doses of the Pfizer. That's down from 5,850 the previous week and 3,900 of Moderna, down from 4,000 the previous week. This uh, 7,800 uh, total dosage weekly total in, instead is um, instead of the approximately 11,000 doses we expected can eventually have an impact on our overall vaccination timeline. We are reaching out to the federal government to see how these allocations can be increased to the 11,700 of doses or more of week, a week. As of today, residents at 21 of the 37 skilled nursing facilities has, have received their first dose of the vaccine. 
As I mentioned previously, all skilled nursing facilities should receive their first dose by January 8th and their second dose by the end of January. As I also mentioned on Tuesday, we are currently working with pharmacies and the federal government to accelerate the first dose vaccination at other long-term care facilities such as residential care and assisted living facilities. Yesterday, I want to give you an update of a, of a situation in Bennington. Yesterday afternoon, the Vermont Veterans Home uh, in Bennington received test results of six of their staff that were positive. Not long after, our VDH, the Department of Department of Health Rapid Response Team, was on the phone with the facility. There will be a facility-wide PCR test uh, t taken today at the facility and then continued twice a week uh, PCR testing for the near future. In addition, the scheduled vaccination clinics for that facility for Sunday will continue. Uh, this is developing, but I did want to give you an update on this event. As I mentioned on Tuesday, after phase 1A, we we're planning that vaccinations will be prioritized and given based on age, because the older you are, the more vulnerable you are to COVID-19. And it meets with our prime objective, protecting lives. In addition, it's the easiest way to administer and the easiest for Vermonters to understand. There will be age bands established when you will be eligible to be vaccinated. For example, 75 plus will be the first to get vaccinated after the completion of 1A, then 70 and over, and then 65 and, and older, and so on and so forth. Underlying conditions will be a priority no matter what the age and those conditions will be actually they have to be well defined and we are working uh, on that right now. We recognize that some individuals may have suffered from health inequities. Our implementation planning will seek to mitigate these inequities. We, real, we also realize that what may come from the national or state advisory panels may be different uh, than what we're planning to do, but their recommendations are advis advisory. And of course, we will look at their recommendations, but our overarching priority is this, saving lives. Every night when I read the positives and see the number of deaths, I must admit that those deaths have a profound impact on me, as it should with everyone that's listening or hearing this broadcast. These Vermonters, mostly older, who we, are the people we need to do everything that we can to protect. So again, what we are trying to do is to design a system that's easily implemented, easily understood, and prioritize our fundamental goal, protecting lives. Definitions such as essential worker or frontline workers often cause confusion, unnecessary divisiveness, and doesn't put enough emphasis on our primary goal of saving lives. I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Levine now. Thank you, Secretary Smith, and uh, in light of the abbreviated conference today, I'm going to keep my comments brief, and I won't repeat anything that you just heard. In terms of uh, some data, though, very quickly, today we're reporting uh, 130 new cases and two deaths. That is a spike after having a daily average for a week or so of 82 cases and a one-day total the day before of 69 cases. This brings our total number of cases throughout the pandemic to 7,412, and unfortunately our total deaths to 136. 
The total number of active cases in long-term care facilities at this time is 539. There are currently 25 patients in the hospital with COVID, seven in an ICU environment. And our percent positivity rate is 2.7%. As I've stated on many occasions, numbers do fluctuate all the time, and one day does not make a trend. As I've been reporting for some time now, during this surge that the region and country have been going through, we've seen cases associated with a wide range of settings, long-term care and health facilities, businesses, workplaces, private events, gatherings, and in K-12 schools as well. But as you just heard from the Governor and Secretary French, cases in schools have been the exception, not the rule, and these are not driving outbreaks. Our effort to test teachers and staff over the past month and a half has quantified the extraordinarily low infection rate among them, and our experience this year has shown that the risk of transmission within schools is indeed very low. I want to personally thank our teachers, administrators, and all other school staff for being so invested in the safety of the school environment. We sincerely appreciate your efforts and your commitment to our children. So we have reached the end, almost, of 2020. All acknowledge it's been a difficult year, to say the least, one that many are eager to put behind. We've lost loved ones, been apart from people we care about. Some have lost jobs, faced financial worries, and been in a nearly constant state of stress as our lives were turned upside down. But we've also come a long way. We've celebrated our healthcare heroes and others on the front lines. We've been able to carefully open schools and businesses. We've adjusted to this new normal of mask wearing and keeping our distance. We've embraced the outdoors and gotten more creative to stay connected and plan activities safely. As individuals, communities, and as a state, we've learned again that we have the strength to persevere. As we know, the turn of the calendar page doesn't necessarily mean immediate change. But as a symbol, I believe we can look forward to 2021 with optimism. It will take a while for all of us to get the COVID-19 vaccine. But knowing that almost 14,000 Vermonters have been vaccinated so far, we can feel change coming. Hospitals are continuing to schedule clinics for healthcare workers, and the timeline for all the long-term cares continues to be accelerated. We may even know some of the people vaccinated already, whether they're relatives in long-term care facilities or healthcare workers who have their photos on social media. Each person is vaccinated, who's vaccinated moves us a little closer towards life as it once was. And in the meantime, I hope the new year gives us all the boost we need right now to give us the inspiration to keep up everything we've been doing to prevent the spread of COVID so that 2021 can fulfill some of our hopes. Now, normally you might be thinking about New Year's resolutions, although in public health, we prefer building sustainable, healthy habits. But this isn't a normal year so I just want to say, if you are setting any goals, please think about how you can take care of your own mental health and those around you. I'd like to bring back a few points from the day that Mental Health Commissioner Sarah Squirrel was here uh, to help guide us into 2021. Stay socially connected. Create daily routines and schedules. Exercise, eat healthy, get enough sleep. Reach out for support, whether you are struggling with anxiety, depression, or just need to talk to someone. If you have children, talk with them. Ask them about their concerns and listen to them. Engage with your community in any ways that are possible and safe. Helping others can actually counteract stress. Finally, since it is New Year's Eve, I hope that if you do celebrate, you find ways to do so safely, either with people you live with 
or with one other trusted household. And if you do gather, please get tested seven days afterward. We could not have made it this far without your help and sacrifice. I wish you all a healthy, happy, and safe New Year. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Uh, we'll turn it uh, open up to questions at this point. All right, as we let all of you know, we do have a hard stop at 12.30 today. So we're gonna take one question at a time. If you have a second question, please flag that for us and we will circle back at the end to those with second questions if there's time. We'll start in the room with Calvin. Um, thank you, Governor. So as Secretary Smith mentioned, um, we're not getting as many vaccines as we'd hoped. Um, it appears that you know the pharmaceutical companies kind of did their job. I mean, where where's the, the log jam? What's holding it up? Yeah, good, good question. And we're looking into uh, why uh, this is the case. Uh, we hope that this is temporary. Uh, that we will be able to scale back up um, because we're we're ready uh, to provide for the vaccinations, but we need the supply, uh, and uh, and it seems as though there's a pent up demand for it as well. So uh, we want to take advantage of the situation while we have it. But our hands are somewhat tied. Um, the federal government is determining uh, through the providers, the manufacturers, as to who gets what, and. Um, we're just we're trying to look into it now. Anything, uh, Secretary Smith, you can add to that? This is at the federal level, and we're really trying to understand what is going on. You can't have a program where there's no predictability in what you're getting, and then you get cut you know, from one week to the next. Um, it really, you need that predictability in order to sustain the program in the way that you want to sustain. So we are looking to our federal partners and saying, what is going on here? Um, and what what is precipitating these sort of wild swings that uh, you can't plan when you have this this sort of wild swing and at the level we have it's going to have an impact on us down the road the way that they've cut these these allocations so i i think calvin to answer your question we got to figure out what is going on at the federal level what has, what has the federal government said so far have, have they communicated with with you guys of you know what what's happening um we haven't got a clear understanding why that we're having this uh this situation happening um you know it, you know that some some uh, administrators at the federal level have apologized i've seen that in the news that there are hiccups at the federal level um, but we got to get beyond apologies now. We just got to get, we got to get the vaccine here in the state. Uh, Governor, I guess I'll ask the political question, but uh, uh, with the uh, wrangling that's gone on in uh, Congress over, uh, over the, the extent, you know, whether 600 or $2,000 on the personal reimbursements, reimbursements for, uh, for uh, COVID, a reaction to that, I mean, the, the fighting and using that as more or less a political football. Um, and then, of course, on the other side of things, we waited so long to sign the bill uh, to help out our unemployed. Um, it cost them a week of uh, unemployment benefits. Yeah, um, I'll answer the last part first. We don't believe that the, um, the uh, length of time it took to sign the bill uh, has uh, had an effect on uh, the unemployment, uh, the amount of uh, uh, weeks that you'll be able to receive. Uh, and I'll ask uh, Commissioner Harrington to uh, substantiate that further. Um, but the rest, uh, you know, it really is unfortunate. And, and I, um, that what we're seeing on the federal level, I'm, I'm thankful the bill got signed. I'm thankful the $600 is being sent out. Uh, immediately, uh, but uh, now we're seeing uh, the the political gamemanship uh, that is being played in in Washington on both sides, and and um, but that doesn't mean uh, you know that we'll have a new Congress soon. Uh, the president-elect will be sworn in. Uh, I'm sure there will be uh, more packages in the future uh, in terms of uh, uh, economic relief for the states and for individuals. So this isn't over. Uh, this this uh, chapter may be over, uh, but the 
we have a long ways to go. And I know that uh, in talking with Senator Sanders, uh, Senator Leahy, and Congressman Welch, uh, that they are going to do whatever they can for future um, economic relief for, again, the states. So I look forward to that. This will get us through the, the next few weeks. And, uh, and uh, it's uh, welcomed in many respects. And we'll just have to go from there. It, they'll do what they what they normally do, and we'll see what happens in the end. And very quickly, uh, we're th we're three weeks away from a new administration. Has that administration reached out to you here in the state? Because obviously, we are the lowest uh, incident. We've done a good job here, um, and they're talking national policy. Um, and we've always talked about you know it's better to be right than to be like everybody else. So. I uh, haven't heard anything directly um, individually to the states at this point in time, but uh, but I'm sure that we'll have um, some dialogue along the way. Uh, they have their hands full uh, right now, understandably, but uh, look forward to, to talking with them. Thank you. All right, folks, just a reminder, one question. If you have a second question, we'll come back to you. I don't want to cut folks off, but please help us out. Aaron, BT Digger. Aaron? Hey, can you hear me? We can. Hello? Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Um, some of the, the reader feedback that we've gotten um, about the latest vaccine prioritization has been asking whether um, people with chronic conditions have enough research done about exactly what conditions put people at additional risk of COVID. Um, you know, there's been a lot of debate about, you know, do, do people with asthma get prioritized over people who are, uh, you know, have a history of cancer or in their past? How, how exactly are you making these decisions about what chronic conditions qualify? And is there going to be prioritization within that group of chronic conditions? Yeah, I think as uh, Secretary Smith had just uh, just mentioned, uh, we have to get uh, clear, more descriptive uh, in terms of what that means to uh, have a chronic condition because a number of people have chronic conditions that don't uh, necessarily mean that, uh, that uh, um, uh, becoming uh, COVID positive would necessarily affect them in ways that it would affect others. But... Uh, I'll let Dr. Levine answer the rest of that. Thank you, Governor. The um, issue of chronic conditions is really an important one uh, because uh, where you set the bar in those chronic conditions can open up the floodgates, literally, and have most Vermonters eligible to get the vaccine first versus having them more stringent. We don't want to make cavalier and uh, quick decisions. We want to make this uh, very much evidence-based. The CDC has already published some of those chronic conditions. Our advisory uh, panel that uh, is submitting a report to me uh, will further hone those. And we'll work with the medical community as well. But to give you an example, um, Obesity itself does allow for people to get COVID more easily. Hypertension has been associated with getting COVID more easily. Neither of those necessarily mean your outcome from having COVID will be worse. But if you have very severe obesity uh, with a very large BMI, that can actually predispose you to a worse outcome. So, it's that kind of decision making that we'll be making uh, to take some conditions that are relatively common but don't necessarily markedly increase your risk of a poor outcome with COVID versus those that do. Aaron, you mentioned asthma. And as it turns out, uh, asthma is not one of the conditions in the lungs that actually leads to a worse outcome with COVID. However, having emphysema, also called COPD, uh, does. 
So we will, we will be pretty precise about those conditions. But you can be sure that conditions that are serious, like COPD, like heart disease, like chronic kidney disease, and having a transplant and being on immunosuppressive therapies will be on the list, because there'll be very little question about those. Greg, the county carrier. Good morning, Governor. Uh, good morning, Governor. I uh, was going to pass on the question this morning. I guess I can't bank my question, so I'll go ahead with it. Um, I'm under the understanding that uh, CARES Act money must be spent by the end of the business day today, and the only fund that it can be put into is the unemployment trust fund. Uh, is that correct? And, and how much money are we talking uh, that's gone unspent? Yeah. Today? Um, well, that was the case, uh, Greg, before the the uh, this latest package was passed, and in there uh, was a provision for more flexibility. In fact, they gave another year uh, for uh, that money to be spent. So. You know, we were very uh, vigilant, dil diligent in terms of uh, making sure that we spent all the money that we received because we were fo following the guidelines. And uh, and in the end, we did have a bit of money left over. Um, so we will we will uh, wait and determine where the best uh, what the best approach is for that. It's about thirty million dollars at this point. Uh, so we'll let this sugar off for a bit and determine where best to uh, to ask the legislature. Uh, to work with us uh, to appropriate that money. So, again, um, w we don't have the deadline at this point in time, nor does any other state uh, right now. Thank you, Governor. I'll talk to you next year. Thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, for Secretary Smith, thanks for the quick follow-up by your office from Tuesday concerning the no-show by the pharmacy a group that had signed up and were waiting for vaccines. Uh, I think we got that resolved. So, so for today, uh, just wondering, for some unknown reason, the state of Vermont chose, again, to hide another significant outbreak from the public this time at the Bennington Police Department just before Christmas. There have been six positive tests for Bennington Police employees, including the chief, who's talked freely about it. it. Got me thinking, how many Vermont Police Departments have been given the vaccine shots so far? Have the state police had their shots, the sheriff's departments? Uh, and and where do Vermont fire departments stand in line since they're often called upon to respond to emergencies or to assist rescue squads by lifting gurneys with patients and other things? Yeah, I can only, I'll speak broadly, but I'll let Secretary Smith answer uh, more specifically. Um, but um, EMS has been included in 1A. Uh, so. That uh, there are many, I think 30% of 37% of, of those uh, in EMS um, have been given the vaccines. So we have a ways to go, and certainly with the uh, fewer amounts of, uh, of vaccines we're receiving, it's going to take a little bit more time uh, to, uh, to inoculate all of them at this point. Um, so I'm going to let uh, Secretary Smith answer the rest of that. Mike, the governor did a pretty good job in answering that. It's it's in in one A, the priorities, as you know, are healthcare workers, particularly those that are patient facing that can save lives, particularly of those that are older, um, that are most vulnerable to the vi the virus. EMS is the is in that group one A. Uh, police departments are not in one A. Fire departments, unless they're EMS, are not in 1A. So, so far, we've vaccinated 992, which is about 35% or 37% of the EMS um, uh, EMS personnel here in the state. Uh, so th that's, that's who we've vaccinated in uh, sort of the emergency response area. So when, when can the police expect uh, the sheriff's local and state police uh, i mean i don't know if commissioner Sherling has any thoughts on getting his Here's, guys protected but right now mike what we're doing is uh, vaccinating by age bands so if um other than the 1a that we talked about 
uh, we're vaccinating by age bands and uh, after 1A, after this initial 1A, which are healthcare workers because they could, ex they could expose uh, those vulnerable Vermonters, uh, vulnerable Vermonters through long-term care facilities, EMS, home health, those sort of uh, uh, personnel. Um, but as I said, after we, after we move to um, finish 1A, which, is supposed, which will be in January if our dosage keeps to where we need it, uh, which will be in January, we'll move to uh, this uh, other vaccination program, and that will be age-based. No, I just wanted to add Hi, that. Hi, thank you. Sorry, just a moment, Lisa. I just wanted to add two sure. things. Number one, that um, some of the people in the category that we were just talking about will, by virtue of age or by medical condition, qualify, obviously, to get earlier vaccine. Uh, we're still working with our advisory committee as well. And I just wanted to more directly respond to Mike's introductory comment about uh, lack of transparency. Again, we are protecting personal health information that can be readily identifiable uh, when we don't release numbers uh, or a setting. And most people, I think, in Vermont understand that very clearly. And God forbid if we announced that there was an outbreak in the Bennington Police Department and someone needed to dial 911 and they said, I'm not going to do that. Uh, that would be the worst possible outcome because it is not the entire Bennington Police Department that is now forbidden from being at the work site. And I'm sure the rest of them are all using the appropriate uh, precautions that we all use. So I would never want that kind of outcome to occur uh, as a byproduct of getting people's radar up about a certain number of cases in a certain setting no matter what that setting be uh, around the state. Thank you. Just one more, th one more thing. We are going to get a little bit more prescriptive about what uh, it means uh, in, in terms of the EM EMS and those who uh, come to the scene of an accident uh, first and have to give uh, emergency first aid and so forth. So uh, we are going to get a little bit more descriptive on, on that. So we may see some within the police force, for example, that may be... Um, may be uh, uh, able to get uh, vaccinated. All right, Lisa, thank you for your patience. Sure, thank you. Um, this is for the governor or Secretary Smith. Do you think um, states are getting enough financial and technical support from the federal government for administering vaccines? Well, again, in the new package, uh, I believe that we are, um, but we certainly could use more of the vaccine itself. So I'm, I'm more concerned about the supply of the vaccine than I am about uh, the, the uh, amount of money uh, to, to deliver uh, the vaccine. Secretary Smith. Lisa, my, my uh, response would be just get us the vaccine and we'll get it into uh, people's arms. Um, we, the, the Congress has been very generous in both um, uh, providing money for vaccination as well as contact tracing as well as testing. So uh, we don't have any issues in terms of what Congress has done in terms of providing us money. I think where our issues are is just um, get, get us the dosages that uh, we need. Okay, thank you. Hi, good morning. I have no questions today. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Eric, the Times Argus. Yes, Governor, the Northfield Select Board has asked you to speak to the Washington County State's Attorney about his handling of the cases involving the police chief. Is that something you plan to do? Well, I, again, I... Uh, I haven't seen the letter uh, myself. I, I know that we received it through the media uh, in the beginning, but maybe we've seen it. We've gotten received it at this point in time. Um, but I'll reflect on on the letter. I have a great deal of respect and faith uh, in the state's attorney. 
uh, in Washington County. It's someone I, I actually appointed, and um, but I I, um, I believe that uh, you know he's offered, from what I understand, from what I've read, um, that he's offered to speak to the uh, select board on his decision, uh, either in private, uh, in executive session, or uh, in public. So um, I'll I'll let him work that out, uh, but if he um, you know, we'll, we'll again watch uh, this this situation, but uh, but I think uh, so far the Washington County uh, State's Attorney has done a pretty good job. Okay, thank you. Greg, the Bennington Banner. Uh, hello, and um, happy New Year. Um, I'm calling. I'm asking about the um, the Vermont Veterans Home outbreak. Uh, is there any understanding of what uh, what might have caused the outbreak or what kind of exposure might have led to the outbreak? And uh, can you tell me a little more about exactly what the rapid response team is doing in terms of responding to the outbreak? Yeah. yeah. First of all, just just remember, we learned about this last night. Um, so to do any contact tracing is going to take uh, a little bit of time. I'm sure they're working on that as we speak. So we don't have any information about that. But Secretary Smith can... Uh, let you know what the rapid response team is doing today and uh, what we'll be doing over the next few days. Thanks, Greg. Um, we learned about, uh, I think the home uh, learned about this around 4 o'clock uh, yesterday afternoon at 5.30 or thereabouts. The rapid response team was on the phone with the veterans' home. What they do is go over protocol, talk about what needs to be happen in terms of continuing business, PPE, do you need PPE needs, all those, do you have staffing needs? They go over all of that, they make sure the needs are met first, then they talk about how do you operate in, in, in a potential COVID environment. And again, I use the word potential because today uh, we are, we have scheduled tests this morning, actually, tests at that facility, uh, facility-wide testing. So they will talk about that testing. There were questions last night like, should we stop the vaccination program on Saturday? And the answer is no. So the rapid response team, A, will make sure that the facility has all the needs that it needs. Uh, and and in terms of staffing, in terms of PPE, it will go over the procedures that have to sort of be in place in terms of keeping residents and staff safe in that facility. It will organize testing, which it has done. It will talk about testing in the future, which it has done because there's going to be twice a week PCR testing, and I suspect more rapid testing as well uh, on a daily basis there. And then it answers any questions that the facility may have. So those are some of the things. Dr. Levine, have I hit everything, or do you want to end? You're good. I have one more thing to say. Okay. Um, and I'll let Dr. Levine just add some things to that, Greg. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to your other part of your question about do we know what caused that? So obviously that's, mm. that's going to uh, be part of what we do when we interview all of the cases and do the contact tracing. But I have to tell you that very frequently you cannot actually find the cause. But at risk of sounding like a broken record, this is a very important point to make because we're not engaged in a finger pointing exercise or a blaming or shaming game here. The reality is, mm -hmm. as we've talked about earlier, Bennington is currently a little more of a hot spot in the state of Vermont. And because of that, it's more likely that people will pick up the virus. Even uh, those who are really honestly trying to uh, keep themselves and their loved ones very safe. And as I showed an example a number of weeks ago, because people may be more likely to pick up the virus because there's more prevalence in that county right now, one of those people may actually work in a long-term care facility. And uh, the virus comes in at a time when they're not symptomatic and are feeling well, uh, totally unintentionally. And this is how these things develop. Uh, and that's why our major goal all along, obviously, is saving lives. But ahead of that, keeping our case counts low enough so that it's less likely for a Vermonter to come into contact with someone 
who uh, is actually uh, harboring the virus. Thank you. Okay. Um one very quick, uh, this is not yet on the public, uh, Department of Public Health website. Didn't know if there was a, a glitch there or if uh, simply hadn't gotten there. Um, or if there was any question to answer there. But that's it. Uh, again, again, we just learned about this last night. Uh, so it right. may not be on the uh, website at this point. But it probably will be today or tonight. Okay. And, and Greg, I have you okay, thank you very much. I have you in the queue for a second question. Uh, yeah, no, I, if, if that's possible, yes, thank you. John, VPR. Thank you, and, and Happy New Year, uh, Governor, and, and your team, and thanks for doing these uh, 100 times. Um, my question is about the town of Stanford. Your thoughts on their resistance to uh, your, your state of emergency and, and COVID safety precautions. Uh, they're claiming it's unconstitutional. Do you see... Uh, any argument there? What what do, what do you do about a community that, a community that just says we're not we're not going to follow this? Well, again, this is the select board that took a an action. Um, I think they voted three to two, and it's still unclear as to me as to whether that's they're suing me in the state or they're just not. Uh, their vote was to not adhere to the. Uh, to the health emergency. Um, but uh, we feel we're on very solid ground constitutionally on this issue. Uh, we've been uh, talking about this for quite some time. So uh, an entity doesn't get to opt out. Uh, they're all part of Vermont, and uh, this has the uh, effect of law. So uh, we feel we're on very solid ground in this issue. I think the uh, I heard this morning that the attorney general uh, had weighed in and sent a letter, I believe, to the town. Uh, but um, Again, we, we, our general counsel uh, feels we, uh, we have nothing to be concerned about. But I, but I do hope um, the folks in Stanford, uh, the residents, uh, continue to adhere to the guidance, protect themselves, protect their families. I mean, we just have a, a little ways to go. The relief's on the way. And I know this is frustrating. I understand. We're all frustrated. We want this to be over. Uh, but by just declaring it over doesn't make it so. Uh, we still have an emergency on our hands, and we're still seeing people dying. So uh, we have to pay attention. Thank you very much. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Uh, this is another question about um, the effect of certain pre-existing conditions on priorities. Um, I received a message from one of our readers uh, that included an article uh, suggesting that people with Down syndrome are much more susceptible to having bad outcomes from COVID. Um, is this something that is on your radar, and do you expect that to factor into your decision about uh, who gets priority for vaccinations? Yeah, again, I'll let Dr. Levine answer this, but uh, uh, but we're looking to the advisory committee for some guidance. We're looking, uh, Dr. Levine is is uh, engaging with others uh, throughout the Department of Health as well as his his uh, counterparts and trying to determine uh, what you know who uh, would be part of this grouping. And and it's important. Uh, we want to be very clear about this uh, so that there's no no question, uh, and that we are prioritizing uh, who the most vulnerable are within this category. So thanks for bringing that to our attention. I am aware of the risk with Downs. It's, um, it's not across the board, every patient with Downs. Um, unfortunately, it's not listed by the CDC in their um, list of conditions. I will say, though, that um, just to educate a little bit about Down syndrome, there's a significant proportion of patients with Down syndrome that do have uh, congenital cardiac issues. And so that would probably be sufficient to move them into that priority group. There are others with Down syndrome who unfortunately have a heightened risk of certain types of cancer. Um, that might move them higher on the list. So even if the syndrome itself 
isn't listed as one of the priority conditions, and I'm not saying it isn't yet, because we're still putting that together, uh, there may be uh, aspects of the condition in an individual with Down syndrome that put them on that list. Thank you, and Happy New Year to all of you. Thank you. Governor, the Vermont State Employees Association newsletter recently claimed your administration is working with a consultant associated with the Pew Charitable Trust to develop a plan for a defined contribution state employee pension plan moving away from the current defined benefit. Uh, is this true? And if so, should we expect a proposal soon? Uh, well, again, I know we have uh, engaged with Pew. We've talked with the legislature about this in the last session as well. I might uh, ask um, Secretary Young if she has any updates on that. I mean, this isn't, I, I'm not saying we're working with them on a specific plan, um, but uh, we've asked for a stress test, and, and as far as I know, they were working on that. Is that correct, Secretary Young? Uh, Governor, that is correct. Um, the Pew is um, doing a stress test on our, our pension. Um, it is something they, they have done as a, in their work as a nonprofit charitable trust for many states. Uh, they do have the ability to do a stress test that's going to test our pension strength uh, in the current economic uh, conditions of um, the COVID pandemic. So I don't we did not ask for any recommendations for a change in plan, and I can uh, share with you the letter that we wrote to them that specifically said that was not our intent. Oh. Um, oh. So we are waiting for the results of the stress test, which we would expect to get within the next week or two, I believe. Thank you. Courtney, Local 22. Um, Dr. Levine, I'm wondering if you've heard much about this new variant of the coronavirus that's allegedly coming from the UK and has now been seen this week in Colorado. Um, have you been briefed at all on this or know much about it? Yes, thanks for that question. I, On a normal press conference day, I would have included it in my opening comments, but I kind of figured we'd get a question about it. Um, so the big news in the last 24 hours is, of course, cases both in Colorado and California uh, for this new strain, which has a variety of different numbers and letters it's going by. The one I've been using is B117. Um, what that ba basically means, it uh, it's, uh, has mutations, so in its genetic coding, there's a variety of mutations, a number of which are to that antigen that we call the spike protein that uh, the vaccines are made against, et cetera. And um, I guess the high points about it, just to be concise, are the number one, it is in this country and in a, a large number of other countries already reporting it. If you recall how coronavirus emerged in our country, you know, there were cases here, cases there, and all of a sudden we had a whole bunch of cases. I would not be surprised if that's how this uh, evolves as well. And that brings me to point two, which is why I wouldn't be surprised, is that it's uh, more transmissible than the, the former coronavirus, the one that we've been living with, uh, without the mutations. So it's estimated to be anywhere between 1.4 and 1.7 times more transmissible. What that means, practically speaking, is one person can give it to more people than the older version of the coronavirus, which, by the way, isn't going anywhere. That's still here, obviously. Um, so that has implications for numbers of cases that people might see in various places in the country. Number three, it's not going to produce a different clinical syndrome. 
still going to have the traditional kinds of symptoms we expect in the type of course we see with coronavirus. Number four, all indications are currently that the vaccines that have been developed thus far will still be effective against this new mutant strain. So that's good news at this point in time. Um, if I could say the bad news would be, number one, that because it's more transmissible, um, it will probably mean that the vaccination rate that will really help us combat COVID will need to be even higher than was previously thought, um, which is OK. I mean, that's just part of the way things are. Um, and that I think we'll see a lot more sequencing of viruses at the level of the Centers for Disease Control in this country, something that hasn't been done uh, with as much vigor as other places in the world, I think will happen even more here now. Um, I think that's probably enough, unless you had any other specific question about it. Yeah, I think that's a lot of good info there. Thank you for that, and Happy New Year. Thank you. Hi, hey, Governor. We've been getting, obviously, a lot of calls, and uh, uh, small businesses are very thankful for that the PPP, the federal grant, is not going to be taxable. But they've received a lot of uh, local companies have received state grants, which are pretty substantial. Do you know if that is going to be taxable income in their 2020 return? I don't, uh, Tim, but be happy to take a, take a look. I don't know if there's anyone. Commissioner Bolio is not on the line. Um, we'll be happy to get back Thank to you on that. I'm sorry. Sorry, it's it's Lindsay Curley. Oh, hi, Lindsay. Um, yes, those. Yeah, just uh, the, the grants that were that small businesses received through ACCD or the Department of Taxes. Those are taxable in their 2020 income. Okay, that's it is, great. They have a few, people have are, a few hours. To, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, it's revenue replacement. So since it's revenue, it is taxable. Okay, yeah, people have a, a few hours anyway to, to make some adjustments. All right, thank you very much. Happy New Year. You bet. Steve, NEK TV? Hi, can you hear me? I can. Oh, uh, great. Um, I wanted to thank Rebecca for moving me up in the queue. Uh, just don't cash that check until Monday, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a question for Dr. Levine, if I may. Um, Dr. Levine, uh, the, the CDC has is, is said that uh, the percentage of uh, respiratory specimens that are testing positive for flu at clinical labs is about one one-tenth of one percent. And they've noticed this, like, worldwide. Um, what happened to, you know, flu A, flu B, uh, we had, what was 200 cases or something of H1N1, uh, last year. I, I, I mean, could, do we know what happened to the flu or, or, or why it's not showing up or why it's not being counted? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, uh, the hypothesis, which began, you know, in the flu season for Australia, which was, you know, months ago, is that all of the behavior changes we've had to prevent the transmission of this respiratory virus, coronavirus, um, is showing some impact on uh, transmission of the flu virus as well, which is a totally different virus. Um, I don't know if that explains the whole picture, and I'd also be a little cautious because we are just getting into January now, and, you know, in Vermont, we know that the flu season, you know, may start October, November, but it can clearly go all the way through to May, uh, so I don't want to just sort of say, check mark, success, we're done. But it really does look like we are only still having sporadic cases, even in Vermont, never mind around the rest of the country. 
and uh, maybe it's because of our behavior change. And that was probably the last thing I should have added to the list of things I spoke to Lisa about with the new uh, mutant strain of coronavirus. Not only do we want to get the vaccination rate up really high, we have to even redouble our efforts to practice physical distancing, avoiding crowds, and wearing masks uh, because this virus is even more transmissible than the uh, former coronavirus. Thanks. You know, from what I've read, that that's a, it's a minor uh, a minor attribute that that they they would think that the flu would be. Um, you know, would be much higher even with the precautionary measures we've been taking for COVID. I agree. But That's why I'm, I, what, I, yeah, I think there's got to be other explanations. I'm just not sure we're aware of what they are yet. All right, we're going to move to Kat at WCAX. Great, thank you. Hi. On Tuesday, you said we had 32,000 vaccines allocated. Does that mean we have all of those in the state now? And if we do, why haven't we given out those shots yet? That means that we don't have those in this, all, all of them in the state. That's what the federal government has allocated for us. And uh, when we do get them into the state, Cat, what we do is uh, get them out as quickly as possible. Some of those are the allocation for the long-term care facilities. Some of those are the allocations for the 14 hospitals. That's why I sort of uh, prefaced my remarks on the reduction of our allocation because, frankly, um, at the allocation levels we have right now, it's going to be hard to keep up in in a matter of weeks. It's going to be hard to keep up with um, our vaccination schedule given what it what is coming in. So you're going to see, like I said, what um, the number that I said today, 14,000 Vermonters have been vaccinated. That that has a potential of accelerating fairly fast here. Thank you. I'll take another question later if we end up having time. Ann Wallace Allen, VT Digger. Um, hi. Uh, this is more of a sort of a philosophical question because it's the end of the year and we're going into a new year. And I'm just sort of wondering what your thoughts are, Governor Scott, on um, the way the state has been changed by the events of 2020, um, whether it's, you know, not in the ordinary ways that it changes every year, but sort of permanently by some of the events that have happened this year? Yeah, that's a fairly deep philosophical question that probably isn't easily answered in a few sentence, sentences, but uh, let me give it a try. Um, you know, through every event, every emergency uh, that we've seen over history, um, there are, you know, a, an effect, a cause and effect, and I believe that uh, we'll, we'll remember uh, some of the lessons learned uh, from this event. Uh, in the the years to come, um, and typically not that many years. My hope is uh, that we'll we'll learn some of these lessons so that we don't uh, resort back to where we were before. I think individually, uh, every single one of us has has uh, found um, maybe a new appreciation for what we've lost, um, and and that could be maybe a loved one, um, but it could be just some of the things that we enjoy doing uh, that we can't do today. Um, and uh, I think we took a lot of that for granted um, previous to this. And it's made me reflect on, you know, some of the, the freedoms that we had before uh, that we haven't been able to take advantage of now, the places we, we typically go, the things we enjoy doing, uh, we haven't been able to do. But at the same time, I, I think that, um, for those who have uh, kids in school, for instance, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's forced us to come together, get be part of their education, uh, and that could be uh, both a positive and a negative, uh, seeing just how challenging it is for some of our teachers and uh, as well uh, for the students uh, during this, in this environment. And, um, and, and there are so many, you know, there's so many other things uh, that I think, again, the family units are, are sticking together more. But, but not seeing a loved one uh, in a uh, long-term care facility for all of these months, not being able to connect with them. I think that that's, uh, that's one thing uh, lost. 
uh, that I think that we uh, maybe took for granted before, but hopefully when we come out of this, that we'll take more time, more time for family, more time for friends, and those simple things in life uh, that we haven't been able to do for the last uh, nine, nine and a half months. Um, I will say the, the well, one... Uh, what about go ahead. the way that the state does the way that you guys do things, the way the state um, operates, just oh, some of the... Um, well, that, the that's not as philosophical. That's more nuts and bolts. Um, I would say, yeah. uh, you know, the remote uh, remote work uh, has been, uh, you know, beneficial. I think we've learned to adapt uh, to this new normal in a short period of time. And I think it has had uh, some, uh, you know, negative, uh, but, but a lot of positive as well. And uh, I think we'll, we'll in the future, uh, be doing more remote, continuing uh, along this approach, uh, which has allowed more flexibility uh, for our state employees. And, uh, and, and we'll see, you know, again, we're, we're not going to go uh, to the extreme that we've seen over the last uh, few months. It's going to be good to get back to normal and in, in more of an office setting. But for many, uh, this provides flexibility. And, uh, and, uh, and I think that, it actually uh, helps with the workload and and does things a, a little bit different and and I think that we've been uh, we, we can benefit from that. Um, thank you. I'd like to take another question at the end if there's time. Okay. Avery WCAX. Governor, we're hearing from some healthcare workers that they had no communication about when and where they're supposed to get a vaccine. These healthcare workers are outpatients, so we've heard from some um, dental workers about it. Um, and what, what, how is it exactly is the state letting Group 1A know about when, they, when they'll get vaccinated? And was our communication systems ready for the rollout? I'm going to look for Dr. Levine first, I think. So... We have a variety of ways of communicating this and basically uh, have worked very closely with the hospitals, have met with them several times. We have things called HANS, which are health alert notifications, which go out to the entire clinical community and create an awareness about who's included in this group of 1A and uh, a prioritization scheme within that group. So. Um, the promise was never made that the first week's allocation, everybody would get what they needed. And I think that's been the ongoing issue because obviously we have to apportion percentages of the vaccine to all of the hospitals across the state, as well as the portion that's going to long-term care. And that has to be taken into account. Uh, and then when allocations, as you've heard from Secretary Smith, decrease on a progressive weekly basis, uh, less people can get the vaccine uh, in that immediate two to three week time period. Doesn't mean they won't all get it through the month of January. It just means that perhaps some of the expectations were a little higher. Uh, and some of those expectations were based on more robust amounts of vaccine coming in. Secretary, yeah, I think, I'm not sure if he wants to say something or not. <laughs> We've been in uh, constant communications. Actually, at 7.30 this morning, Dr. Levine and I were meeting with the Hospital Association to make sure that there is um, distribution and, and talking with them. It was a two-way sort of conversation, making sure that there are things that they're seeing that we're not aware of and things that we're, we're seeing that they may not be aware of. But that, that kind of communication is ongoing. Uh, on a on a constant basis and making sure that there's equitable distribution not only within the hospital walls but outside the hospital walls and if you look at the EMS uh, sort of uptake uh, that's that gives us some indication of making sure that uh, vac vaccination is vaccines are going out outside the walls. But there's more to do, and in the in in January there's a lot more to do as we get this 1A uh, healthcare workers uh, vaccinated. Thank you. Did I get us through the, the through the queue? I am going to go back those who have said they have a second question uh, for eight more minutes, but once we hit 12.35, uh, we'll have to wrap up. I'm gonna start with Greg from the Bennington Banner. 
Thank you, Rebecca. I think this is for Dr. Levine. Um, this is more of a, of a question about sort of the overall Bennington County situation. We have 159 cases in the past 14 days. We've got employees testing positive at the police department and at the veterans home. Uh, so are you concerned that this is turning into a community spread situation here in Bennington County? And what specific information from contact tracing can you share about the, the way you understand how the virus is spreading here and if there are places people should avoid or things other than the, uh, the protocol that we've been hammering home all along uh, uh, people should follow? Yeah, all, all very good questions. So um, as you know, we did have one outbreak we reported in Bennington County. And um, that one has involved the police. Um, a secondary outbreaks from that occur. It's usually one individual who may live in the same household as someone, one individual who may be at a work site with someone, something of that sort. So nothing that turns into itself a, a large production. Um, the numbers of cases associated with the Bennington outbreak are not increasing rapidly and markedly. Uh, so I think we're seeing more cases in the community as opposed to ones that are specifically identified as a, having an epidemiologic linkage to that particular outbreak. But more to come on that front. Um, what we traditionally see in these kinds of situations, though, is that there are sites throughout the county that we'll find a case in. And if they happen to be a work site or a school or a healthcare related facility or a long term care facility, we pay special attention, obviously, but we don't see a lot of those turning into multiple case exercises. It's too early for me to say anything more about the veterans' home because, as you heard, we're literally uh, 16 hours in, into our knowledge of this and gathering all the appropriate data. But I certainly wouldn't tell people to avoid going out of their house or going to a specific uh, location. Uh, and I would definitely reinforce what you just said, which is taking all of the usual precautions every time you go out. Okay, thank you. And thanks for the opportunity to ask the second question. Yeah, Greg, I just want to just uh, follow up as well, um, because I want to send this word of caution out. I, there has been some contact tracing done in Bennington County where there have been multiple family get-togethers. And I just think, and we have seen sort of uh, cases develop out of those multiple family get-togethers. Um, this is important because we... You know, we saw what happened in Halloween. We saw what happened elsewhere. Um, and I just want to just ca take this time to caution people about the multiple family um, get togethers um, and just to be very, very ca uh, careful, especially as we go run into tonight and into tomorrow. Hi, Dr. Levine, a, a reader who's over 70, but not a 1A or 1B otherwise, got a notice from this pharmacy to get on their vaccination list. And he's wondering, well, I thought there wasn't a, a list, and what should he do? Are the pharmacies sort of operating outside of the BDH on that? So let, let me take it one point at a time. Let's get 1B out of our vocabulary. You know, we're, we're going to get through 1A, and then we're going to have priority groups. You've already heard about some of the age banding. Uh, so uh, somebody 70 is certainly in a high priority group. Maybe they'll come after someone who's 75, but that's, you know, literally they're very high on uh, that prioritization scheme. Uh, secondly, um, this may be a little bit of a rogue pharmacy I'm hearing because uh, most of the time I'm hearing from both physicians' offices and pharmacies and hospitals, we're getting too many calls. People want to be on the list, and we don't have a list. Uh, and that should be the message right now. Uh, so uh, if that pharmacy that he's involved with is, is being proactive and signing him up so he has an appointment for the hypothetical date that he might fall into line and the vaccine may be in the pharmacy's hands, that would be great. But right now, people should just respect the process and understand that we will have 
registration schemes uh, set up for wherever people are going to go so that it'll be a smooth process. Um, this is very interesting to hear, though. Thanks for cluing us in. Thank you. If I, if I could just add, uh, if that is a, a request or for someone to come in for a flu vaccine, um, we are still advocating for people to get their flu shots. So th those are still available for 70 years old or any yeah, age at this point. Yeah, there was a COVID vaccine. Yeah. Well, you could put that plug in, Tim, you know, for flu. Okay, I will. Thank you. All right. I think we might fit in one more. Next up was Mike Donahue. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, thanks, and I had a second unrelated question, but I guess I need to follow up on the first question from, that I asked. With all due respect to the health commissioner's theory about what he oh, thinks. Oh, God, here we go. Vermonters have repeatedly called, emailed, and texted to say they want to know about hotspots. So they want to make informed decisions about their health, and that comes from having relevant information. So I question whether if somebody doesn't want to call the Bennington PD due to COVID, would the state police or the sheriff refuse to assist somebody calling 911? I really doubt it. So, I, And I just got one of the texts I got just said, the UVM Medical Center is giving vaccines to all employees, including work from home office workers. And the reader is wondering how do they get to move ahead in the line? Yeah. Especially when police and fire are responding to emergencies, untimely death, right. accidents. Mike, where, if I could just answer that, and maybe I'll have Mike Smith to follow up, but uh, um, we have been made aware uh, that uh, that isn't what we had in mind. Uh, and we want to make sure that. Uh, they uh, prioritize and get to the frontline workers and not the back of the house management and so forth. Um, so uh, we, uh, I think, I believe that Secretary Smith had a conversation with them this morning. I think it's more clear uh, with the CEOs of the hospitals uh, that that's what we want uh, to have happen. Uh, everyone needs to prioritize here and make sure that we're getting vaccines uh, to those who, who are in contact with the highest risks, the older Vermonters, to prevent death. That's what we're trying to do, is make sure that we prevent deaths at this point. We're prioritizing that. So anyone who has, has uh, public facing with those folks that are at the highest risk of death, we want to make sure they get vaccinated. Secretary Smith, anything? Okay, yeah. No, that certainly made sense. I yeah. was wondering if well, I'm and, 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 and I'm, I'm not, yeah. I'm not debating whether it's happening or not because we heard some of the same things, but we wanted to make sure that they, they understood that's not what we had in mind. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. And uh, again, I hope everyone has a very, very safe uh, New Year's weekend, and uh, we'll see you next week on Tuesday. Thank you.